Thank you, uh, Dr. Liu. And uh, good morning. No, no response? <laughs> OK, I'm an economist by training. So I know you don't like economics. But today, uh, my presentation is mostly economics, but more policy-oriented, uh, maybe stories. Yeah? So maybe you can, you can enjoy you know, some of the understanding of Korean economy in terms of uh, international trade. Before I start, I will say you, I will, I will talk to you, like uh, Korea uh, really make economic development. Uh, you can see Korea as, as of today. Is it, this is because of our international trade. Really, uh, we were a very poor country, but we transformed my country into uh, not quite yet, you know, uh, most advanced economy, but uh, uh, maybe middle, middle power economy. Uh, main, you know, contribution factor was international trade. So today, uh, I would like to uh, discuss with you mainly two parts. Uh, one is how Korea is doing trade. In other words, in terms of our performance, in terms of our trade partners with whom we are trading, those kind of you know, trade aspect of the Korean economy, we will study that uh, in the first you know, maybe half. In the second half, I will talk about more on uh, trade policy evolution uh, from long time ago to uh, uh, today. And then maybe we will have some time for interactive discussions. You can ask some questions. OK, um, let me turn to the first page. Uh, you know, t yesterday or something, you know, yesterday, North Korea also shoot the missiles. So we are still in a kind of, uh, uh, it's not actual war, but war kind of uh, framework. We had a Korean War in early 1950s, before you, you were born, maybe before your parents were born. Right? But uh, I'm old enough. Uh, I was born in 1952 uh, during the Korean War. My family used to live in Seoul, but we all went down to Busan. Busan is the southern part, most southern part of Korean Peninsula, you know, not, not, you know, except uh, Jeju Island. But in any case, our family went down there, and I was fortunate enough to be born uh, during, that, during that time. And uh, since uh, my birthplace is Busan, I become a person from Busan. I'm not living in Busan. My hometown is Gyeonggi province. But uh, these days, I cannot claim that, because you know, all the documents ask where you were born. I was born in Busan. I don't know whether you like uh, baseball or Korean uh, baseball. We have a baseball team of Busan. We call uh, uh, a giant. You know, without any kind of hesitation, I, I'm, I'm rooting for Busan because I was born uh, in Busan. Any, anyway, so Korean War uh, broke in 1950. It lasts three years. And then uh, Korea was divided, right? North and South. And if you look at the South, at that time, northern part of the Korean Peninsula was more industrial area. Okay, they can produce uh, industrial goods, and also they can produce lots of natural resources. So very rich in that kind of context. But southern part is mostly uh, agricultural area, rural area. And you, you, you go to a, a Gangnam area, very, you know, fancy area these days, but in the seven, even until the 1970s, there was a, all the you know, area was rice paddy. Hmm? Lots of, you know, the dirt, uh, uh, mud, you know, dirt, you know, that kind of stuff. No buildings at all. Hmm? So we are divided, but southern part is mostly agricultural sector, but uh, we have more population. Right, right now, the population uh, ratio is almost one to two. But even at that time, South Korea has more population. So big population, only land, rice uh, growing land, no industrial base, no natural resources. We were very, very poor okay, at that time. 
And uh, so what do we do? We heavily depend on international aid. So then after, the, after the war, many advanced countries are giving some aid to co Korea. So you know, major part of Korean GDP at that time is from uh, aid. And according to many documents, Korea was one of the poorest country in Asia because we are not uh, including uh, Africa at the time. In Asia, Korea was one of the most poor you know, country. And the uh, per capita uh, GDP, even in you know, a long time ago, is $80. Hmm? In other words, per month, $7. So we are that poor. But one thing uh, I won't tell you is this. Uh, I, was, uh, I took a sabbatical year from my university in 2004. I went to the World Bank, uh, which is in uh, Washington, D.C. I was a visiting scholar. Every year in Washington, every other year in Washington, IMF, World Bank, is holding annual conference, which means that they are inviting all the you know, bank of, uh, central bank governors, financial you know, institutions, uh, 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 president, all the financial people coming to uh, Washington. Uh, maybe uh, October. Uh, one year they are holding this in Washington, another year they are holding the same annual meeting outside Washington. In any case, in October I was sitting in the World Bank office, somebody sent me a, a kind of a speech uh, text, which was made by uh, Deputy uh, Managing Director of IMF. Uh, at the time, you know, the, the deputy managing director is a professor, used to be professor at University of Minnesota, the lady professor, Ann Kruger, very famous uh, development economist. Uh, he, 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 he liked Korea very much too. And he gave a speech uh, before the governors uh, from uh, African countries, maybe 30 governors. She was describing a country which was so poor uh, even they don't have any hope for future. No resources, you know, no industrial base. These African governors look to each other. Is she talking about my country or your country? But it actually, she was describing the case of Korea hmm? in the, seven, in the, in the you know, 50s and 60s. And also, uh, she told us, according to the documents released by State Department, of United States in the uh, 1950s. They are asking the government, the, the, the document saying, Korea is so poor, there's no hope for future. So why don't we reduce our size of grant which is given to Korea? And rather we want to use this money for other countries which may be you know, having some hope for future development. So we are in that kind of poor situation. So to describe uh, the whole stories, let me show you this picture. Hmm? This is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you go to city area, city hall area, uh, we call Cheonggye, Cheonggyecheon, Cheonggye River. This is the river, you, you see this today, uh, this is 1950s, late 1950s. Actually, this is a house along the stream, very poorly situated and the people lived there. I mean. And um, after, you know, 1960s, uh, after Park Jong-hee, President Park Jong-hee came in, you know, they cover this whole small river by cement, and we make a highway, you know, those kind of things. Later, uh, the city mayor, uh, former President Lee myung Bak, he was a uh, Seoul city mayor, he discard all the kind of cements, and they make a beautiful, uh, uh, stream. But anyway, this is a picture. I show many pictures to foreign uh, 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 you know, students, foreign you know, professors, foreign government officials. They saw many pictures, but this is a picture they think this is most impressive. I mean, this is a picture Korea was in 1950s. Let me show you uh, Korean economy in 19, uh, 2016. Population slightly over 5 million people. This is 0.7% of the world population. 
you know, normally World Bank and other international organizations uh, called Korean uh, economic development as a uh, miracle of Han River. We have a river, big river, so they are calling it miracle of Han River. But those people who are studying Korean wave, Korean culture, Korean music, they are talking about miracle of 0.7 percent, you know, not miracle of Han River, miracle of 0.7. We have small population where well, we are quite influential, uh, uh, you know, to the uh, young young society, young community in the world. In any case, uh, North Korea is only half of uh, South Korea, 25 million, and our GDP slightly over one trillion dollars. But this is very important. 1.4 trillion dollars of GDP, which is 1.8 percent of the world GDP. 1.8 percent. This is a key factor why Korea is trying to export more, try to connect our economy into the you know, rest of the world. This is a key factor because we are small. We want to be a, with the you know, 50 million population, we cannot uh, develop out of own, only own domestic market. We have to connect it. We have to be connected with the rest of the world. And the uh, per capita GDP, uh, $27,000, but we are struggling actually. Some, somewhere $20,000, it lasted more than 20 years. Okay, we cannot really jump to the $35,000 or $40,000 uh, anymore. Very, very difficult. You know, we achieve huge development, but after 20,000, 22, 23, depends on the exchange rate values, it is awfully, awfully difficult to go into the you know, real advanced country level. But still, uh, among many countries with that kind of population size, there are only two or three candidates which can actually enter into real advanced countries, like Taiwan is one of the uh, candidate, and Korea is also one of the candidates. Other than that, uh, many countries, developing countries, you know, are struggling in, in terms of enhancing their per capita income. And our trade, all the statistics is 2016, but the trade, Korean tr statistics I can update, but the world statistics is not yet, uh, you know, available, so it's 2015, but uh, it's one trillion dollars. So look at the you know, size of the GDP and size of the Korean uh, trade, similar to each other. Hmm? Not quite the same, but similar to each other. And our trade is 2.9% of the world, world, uh, uh, world trade volume. So we are doing much better than our uh, GDP. So this is our summary of the, you know, today's uh, uh, Korean economy, uh, snapshot of the Korean economy. Let me show you, this is the beautiful Chongye uh, uh, stream area, you can see today, you saw the, you know, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, how, how poor this area was. So this is uh, one uh, comparison you can, you can have, Korea in the past and Korea now. Okay, so uh, these, these are the topics. Uh, you know, after one hour, we'll have a break, so we can, we can have some kind of uh, breathing uh, space be between our, our lectures and discussion. Trade performance, trade uh, relations with other partners, and then evolution of Korea's trade policy, and current state of Korea's FTA, implications of Korea's FTA network, and Korea's prospective uh, trade policy. Maybe half of the topics we will do, and then after the break, uh, remaining half, okay? So, Korea's trade performance. I can go back to 1980s and 1990s, but uh, you can see the, the gray bar is a total trade. It is increasing all the way from 60s, 70s, 80s. So 2008, uh, our exports are getting together and we have to celebrate. Maybe next year we'll have a, a record year of reaching our trade reaching to $1 trillion given the you know, speed of our increase. But uh, you all know that very well, economist uh, is very weak in prediction. You know, if you forecast by economist, it doesn't really write you know, all the time. So we make a, a huge mistake in terms of predicting our trade volume because 2008, 
You remember what happened to the world economy? Big financial crisis happened from the uh, United States, right? So, so 2008, we have a big crisis. Naturally, 2009, all the trade volume plunged, okay? World trade volume plunged by 20%, and Korea was not an exception. So 2009, almost, you know, like a $800 billion, $850 billion, we are reaching to the you know, $1 trillion, it plunged to a $60, $600 billion, about 20% uh, decrease in 2009. And luckily, after 2009, world economy started to recover a little bit. And uh, especially, I don't know why, trade recovered quite quickly. Hmm? 2009 and 2010, world trade uh, picked up, and the Korea was doing very, very well. So 2009, 2010, and finally, 2011. Uh, I don't like this factor, but you know, Korea is a country uh, we calculate you know, daily trade volume through the you know, customs office. We are, we are pretty good because we have a very advanced IT systems. So every day, how much we are exporting, how much we are importing, it's like a preliminary, preliminary estimate, but still we are doing that. And according to the government, December 5th of 2011, our import plus export just reached you know, $1 trillion. So make that, we make that day as a trade day. You know, we are celebrating trade day. And uh, this year, uh, 2000, I mean, 2016, December 5th, we will have another uh, trade day cel celebration. But anyway, two uh, as I said, 2009 plunge in 2010 and you know, it's, it's okay. 2011 through 2014, one trillion dollar status was maintained. 2015 and 16, it go below one trillion dollars. And you know, like uh, 2016, uh, very poor. But luckily, coming into this year, our officials are estimating we are reaching back to the you know, one trillion dollars because we are, world economy is recovering. Then that means Korea can do much better. Uh, trade is increasing by uh, more than 15 or 20 percent. So it's a good sign. But the you know, quality of trade, in other words, uh, these this exports are mainly by big companies for small items, semiconductors and you know, automobile. So uh, small and medium-sized companies are not doing very well, but uh, our big companies are doing very, very good. Uh, and uh, our trade is led by that big, uh, big companies. So in other words, plunge, growing, and then very impressive one trillion dollar uh, tr uh, trade, and then decrease again below one trillion dollar level, and then luckily, 2017, it, all, it, it, it is supposed to be hitting the another uh, one trillion dollar mark. Uh, uh, I'm sure it, it will, but you know, but we can see uh, later when the uh, data are, are out. Okay, so I already told you. However, I want to tell you one thing here. One trillion dollar trade uh, country means there are only nine countries in the world which is doing trade more than one trillion dollars a year. Hmm? Starting with China. China is the number one largest trading nation is China and then uh, United States, and then maybe Germany, Japan, Netherlands, you know, and Italy, France, UK, you can name advanced countries, and then Korea, ninth uh, largest trading nation. But in terms of export performance, we are actually six, number six in the world. So counting the individual countries, uh, EU is a you know, collection of countries, but counting the individual countries, even Korea's uh, export performance is ranked at number six in the world. Very impressive, you know, very small country, and uh, you saw you know, a very poor situation in the 60s. And uh, these stories I already told you. I mean, we, we reached the one trillion dollars and then going back, you know, going back uh, below to uh, below one trillion dollars, and then this year we may come back to 
of uh, uh, one trillion dollars trading nation. Okay, next thing is with whom uh, we are trading with. So here our major uh, four or five uh, partners are here, which is US, China, Japan, EU. Later I will explain our trade with ASEAN. ASEAN is uh, ASEAN 10 countries, right? Here, three advanced countries and China. The rest of them is, including ASEAN, mostly developing countries, okay? So look at this uh, uh, diagram here. United States, this is year 2000. But if you go back to uh, mid-1980s, our trade with the United States is almost 40% out of our total trade, 40%. So our major, major trading uh, partner used to be United States. But that uh, almost 40% is every year is decreasing, 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 and then 20% in 2000. And then 2005, almost 12%. And then 2010, it's below, slightly below 10%, okay? Right now, 2016 is above, slightly above, uh, uh, 10 percent. In other words, our trade with, relatively speaking, our trade with the United States has been declining all the way since mid-1980s. What about our trade with Japan? Japan also it, it is decreasing in terms of uh, relative percentages. What about uh, with the EU? Not impressive. Um, almost you know, 10 percent, 9 percent, you know, those kind of things. Uh, the reason is EU uh, 28 countries, maybe you know, sooner or later it will be 27 countries, but uh, you know, 28 countries, they are trading to each other. EU are not, you know, is not trading with outside the region. They are trading, but mostly concentrated within, uh, within EU area. That's why we are not doing you know, big trade with uh, EU. But if you combine the EU economy's GDP, it's a huge you know, economy. Is larger than the United States. So uh, from the Korean uh, government policymakers' viewpoint, it is important market. Most advanced, you know, very, very big country. So uh, we are paying much attention to our trade with the EU. But in any case, at the moment, almost 10%, uh, Japan less than 10%, the United States slightly more than 10%. But you know, uh, what about China? We had a, a diplomatic normalization uh, with China in 1992. Since then, it's all the way up to today. It's more than uh, uh, almost, you know, 25% of our trade is with, uh, with China. So if you combine all this together, major countries, it's about 50 or 55%. Rest of them, we are doing it with the developing countries. But uh, the point I want to make here is this. Our trade, relatively speaking, with the United States has been declining. Hmm? And uh, we are not doing very well with the EU either. For Japan, I will tell you a little bit uh, later the story, our relationship with uh, Japan. China is okay, it's increasing. But if you look at as a policymaker or trade economist, if you look at the declining trend of Korea's trade with the United States and EU, what kind of uh, uh, thinking you are having? I mean, is it okay because we have another market like China or other developing country? Or you may feel like, you know, it's not a very good sign because uh, not just in you know, a market size, but the United States is the biggest market in the world, but U.S. is most advanced country in the world. If you are losing your market share or your competitiveness in the U.S. market, that means your future uh, status of your economy or your products are not very bright, right? So you must do pretty good or even maintain the you know, market share in the United States, not declining. So US policy, uh, Korean policy makers and also like economists like me, we are strongly suggesting to the government, we have to do something about declining trend of our trade with the United States. It has to be reversed, hmm? otherwise, our future uh, performance of our products or firms are not very bright. Hmm? And also we want to emphasize that our trade in EU should be also emphasized. So this is a may maybe background why Korea decided to have an FTA with the United States. 
So there are many other reasons. But uh, simply speaking, declining trend is not a good sign for the future uh, status of Korean products. So maybe that uh, uh, was the one of the main reasons why the Korean government was considering having FTA with the United States. In any case, these are the situation. Okay, that's how we 50% with our major trading nations, another 50% rest of the world. Okay. So let's look at the, uh, our trade with the major trading uh, partners. United States, uh, you know, impressive growth, but uh, relatively uh, speaking, the trade was declining. As of 2016, uh, we have a trade surplus uh, against the United States, uh, slightly over $20 billion. You know why Trump is complaining, right? You know, Korea is one of them. I told you Korea's performance was declining all the time, up until 2010. Let's look at the, uh, this picture here. This is a so-called trade intensity index. It sounds very technical, but uh, this index means the index is above, bigger than one, that means Korea is doing better than world average. If this index number is less than one, that means Korea is not doing as well as the rest of the world. So early part, even 2001, 2003, all the figures are above one. This blue one, blue one is export intensity. It is above one, 1 1.2, and means we are doing 20% better than the rest of the world in terms of our export to the United States. But uh, 2005, it become below one, and then all the way up to 2011, if this figure is, this, this you know, index, uh, like a 0.85, that means we are doing 50% less or weaker performance than the uh, rest of the world. So it, it is not good. So uh, that's why we have a negotiation with the United States and our uh, FTA start to, be, start to be implemented as of March the 15th of 2012. When I was a trade minister, I actually finished the last part of the you know, negotiation, not the whole, whole negotiation. So after that, uh, mm, okay. This is, look at this, all the you know, indexes are now moving upward, right? It's not that impressive, but you know, the trend is reversed. And we say that this is because of the Korea US FTA. We are having some difficulties right now because uh, President Trump want to renegotiate chorus, you know, Korea US FTA. If US is not satisfied, he said that I want to cancel the, you know, the, the discard the uh, FTA. I don't know whether he really do it or not, but he's doing it that kind of stuff with the NAFTA, which is North American free trade a area and also uh, chorus Korea US FTA. But anyway, this is Korea US trade relations. What about Korea EU? I told you we are not very impressive in terms of our performance uh, with, uh, with the EU, but after uh, Korea EU uh, FTA negotiations started later than Korea US FTA. But, uh, you know, ratification, all kinds of processes, much faster than Korea US FTA. So it started uh, on July 1st, 2011, like a almost you know, nine months or 10 months before Korea-US uh, FTA started. So look at this. Here it's above one, but the, you know, uh, recently all, all the figures are less than one, but uh, again, after 2011, it is picking up. So we, we kind of uh, evaluate this kind of phenomena as a success out of uh, our FTA with, uh, with the EU. Okay, Korea, Japan, uh, we are having, what, the, the total volume is not very impressive, but uh, we are having $23 billion deficit uh, against uh, Japan. But if you see the next line, we never have, you know, any single year we have a trade surplus with uh, Japan since 1960s. So always, every year, it used to be more than $35 billion is, you know, uh, decreased a little bit, but uh, we are still heavily depend on uh, Japanese economy. Uh, maybe historically, 
you know, Japan occupied Korea for 36 years. So our senior business people are close to Japanese uh, colleagues, you know, counterparts. So we are heavily dependent on steel capital goods, components, very high tech, you know, materials. Uh, we are still depending upon because our technology is not yet uh, you know, fully catching up with uh, Japanese technology. We have to. So every, every item, automobile, uh, smartphones, every item we have some parts which are imported uh, from Japan because it's essential, essential parts. So we are having huge deficit. What about our export to, United, uh, export to China, uh, Japan? Not very well. We are not selling cars to Japan. Japan is producing you know, very nice cars, so they are not importing any cars from Korea. Even smartphones, we cannot sell there because they have their own smartphone system. They, they like their products very much. Not because of uh, patriotism or, or because of national, nationalistic view, but they believe the item Japan uh, produces are the best. I mean, we, to some extent, we can, we can understand that, but they are not really diversify their uh, consumption products. So we are not doing very, very well uh, uh, in Japanese market, but Korea is not the only one. Major countries like the United States still having difficulties in selling goods uh, uh, to Japan. Okay, uh, what about uh, Korea-China? This is the most impress impressive uh, performance. Uh, I mean, among all the pairs, pair countries in the world, we started trade no, heavily in 1962, 1992, the volume was only six billion dollars. In 2016, 211, and 2015 is even bigger, uh, almost 37 times, 35 times, 34 times increase over 20 year period. Very, very impressive. And uh, why is that so? We are close to each other our industrial development status are quite complementary, and um, we are having $30.5 billion trade surplus. How, how, how about the, uh, if Japanese, I mean, uh, Chinese uh, officials uh, know this kind of figure, are they happy or are not happy? They are not happy, you know, they are having $35 billion deficit against Korea, but they cannot complain this very much because China has having more than $350, 50 billion dollars of trade surplus against the United States. $350 billion dollars trade surplus. So that's the situation in any case. But why Korea succeed? I mean, Korea is a very unique country among major trading nations which is having trade surplus against China. All other countries are having deficits. Why is that so? The key reason is this. There are many, many Korean companies operating in China. Since 1992, you know, 1992, China is starting to open. And at that time, Chinese wage is really, really low. Very cheap uh, Chinese uh, labors. So many Korean companies, uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is not rough, you know, it's not correct figure, but I gather, I gather this kind of information in 2012. More than 25,000 companies are operating in China, from small company to Samsung or LG. Most of them, most of them went there to utilize Chinese labels. They are not thinking about Chinese market, okay? China has been what, world factory, so-called. They are producing everything, right? But by, by their own firms, but mainly by, by uh, foreign firms. These foreign firms, including Korean firms, they cannot produce everything in China. They are mainly using Chinese labor. But the parts and components, capital goods, where do they import? Their own home countries. So 25,000 Korean firms are making some goods in China but most of the parts, components, capital goods, they are importing from their parent company in Korea. So in fact, Korea-China trade was inter-firm trade, inter-Korean firm trade, okay? Once they import parts and component using Chinese labor, assemble and make uh, the goods, what do they do with these goods? Mostly, they sell outside China. Hmm? 
So that's the kind of typical, typical pattern. That's why we have a huge surplus because Korean parent company are exporting to their subsidiaries in China. That's the surplus. We are not earning money by selling goods to Chinese market. Not, not, many, not, many, good, not many companies. The only thing is we are giving some wages to Chinese labor. So huge surplus is not coming from Chinese domestic market. It's coming from old market. Simply, we are having huge surplus with China because you know, we have uh, our subsidiaries. Many sub subsidiaries are there. They are importing things from, from, from Korea. So the trade you know, uh, concept of Korea-China trade has been a little bit distorted. We are not really trading with China. We are trading with Korean firms in China. But now China, uh, I said, uh, per capita income, roughly speaking, $80,000, $8,000. What about the Vietnam, $2,700. So Chinese labor cost is three times more expensive than Vietnam. Then what do you think? Many companies are now leaving China, going to Vietnam or Indonesia, seeking for low wages. And uh, China is also changing a lot, too. Uh, they don't want to import uh, parts and components from other countries. They, they want to rather produce domestically. So that kind of thing is happening. But anyway, this is the last thing here. Uh, Korean firms in China have focused on so-called processing trade or assembly trade rather than focusing on Chinese domestic market. But now Chinese leadership uh, changing the focus of their policy. We are expanding our domestic market. We are developing the inland, very poorly developed you know, uh, region of China. We are focusing more on that. We are not giving incentives for foreign firms who are producing goods and export to outside the world. So policy is changing. That's the kind of situation. And uh, one more, uh, our partner is ASEAN, I told you. ASEAN, 10 countries. The total ASEAN uh, country's GDP is slightly over uh, two, two and a half uh, times of Korean GDP. It's not a big 10 countries, huge population. The economy was not, economy is not very big, but still our trade is like, like a, what, uh, in 2016, 118 billion dollars. Uh, our trade with 10 countries is bigger than Korea-US trade, bigger than Korea-EU trade, bigger than Korea-Japan trade. So we are having huge trade uh, uh, activities between Korea and ASEAN. We are quite complementary because ASEAN's uh, more resources, more agricultural-based economy. We are more manufacturing, you know, manufacturing industrial-based economy. So we are changing uh, our trade very much. And also, one more thing is, because of wage increase in China, Korean companies are now moving to ASEAN countries. Then trade will be picking up. Because again, we have a trade between parent companies and subsidiaries. For example, in Vietnam, Hanoi, I actually uh, visit uh, that company. Samsung has a huge assembly company in uh, uh, Vietnam. The, all the Galaxy phones and nodes and every, everything which is starting with the Galaxy by Samsung are assembled in Hanoi, Vietnam. Uh, they hire 65,000 young you know, lady workers out of high school, they are assembling these kind of things. So our trade with ASEAN is very healthy, and that's why our president uh, went to Philippines and Vietnam, and we have a good uh, meeting uh, saying that you know, our trade uh, with the ASEAN will be on par of our trade with the US and EU. We are really paying more attention to our trade with ASEAN. Okay, then what about the rest of the uh, area we are trading with? Of course, the Middle East. It used to be uh, this uh, green bar used to be huge because we are importing a lot from uh, oil, a lot from Middle East, 100% of oil, almost 100% we are importing from uh, uh, Middle East. But uh, oil price become very cheap that's why we are getting much more benefits because you know, our input uh, is decreasing. But anyway, 
uh, we are still importing a lot from uh, Middle East, but in terms of our export, the blue, blue color, is, we are not doing very well. ASEAN already talked about that. And Latin America, Brazil, you know, Argentina, Mexico, many, many important countries, but our trade with you know, this Latin America is not very impressive. I heard yesterday, uh, Korean government is considering, well, they, have been, they have been discussing this for a long, long time, uh, with Mercosur, which is uh, Brazil, Argentina, and other countries, they are soon starting the negotiation of FTA. Then maybe we can expand our trade with, uh, with uh, Latin America. Russia, powerful country, very big country. We are not doing very much of trade. And India, we have a FTA with India. But uh, you know, the size, total trade is less than $20 billion. $20 billion, very, very small. And what about uh, Africa? Of course, you know, we aren't doing very well. So Korean companies are concentrating on major partners. And the rest of them, they are doing some, but not very impressively. So all in all, uh, the implication by looking at the, you know, the, uh, our trade relations, uh, I already told you the idea. Why did you have a Korea EU FTA, Korea US FTA? The Korean government never say, you know, why we are doing this. But my interpretation as an economist, and later I joined the government, and I make, you know, I, I emphasize this factor very much. If you lose your market share in the US and EU, that means you will, be, you will not be doing very well in the future because your products, your, you know, exports are soon caught, by, caught up by uh, other, other countries because we are, you, your goods are not very impressive hmm? in terms of technology or innovation, things like that. So we must make our extra effort to increase or still, you know, at least maintain our performance in the advanced uh, countries like United States and uh, uh, EU. So here I said uh, our motivation is to maintain or improve our competitive edge of Korean products in the advanced, uh, advanced market, such as US and EU. Korea needed definitely FTA with the uh, United States and EU. Okay. We had a negotiation uh, with the United States uh, almost two years, 2005 until 2007. So June the 30th, uh, everything is concluded. And then actual implementation started March the 15th, 2012. In other words, it took five years to start implementation. Why? Because both countries had some problems. United States, uh, at the time, Obama, President Obama, uh, doesn't like uh, the whole, uh, he, he liked the whole, whole you know, chorus, uh, Korea USFT, but he doesn't like the one section on on automobile, he doesn't like it very much. So we have a little revision, so it takes some time. And then Korean people, uh, agricultural people, and some politicians, they don't like a Korea US FTA. Definitely in the Korean society, we have a certain segment of the society which maintains strong anti-American uh, sentiment. Not only economics, but the whole, you know, everything, every, every aspect. So they are opposing the uh, Korea USFTA. And then National Assembly is strongly opposing in terms of ratification. It took uh, almost five years, but finally it uh, passed you know, the whole thing. But after five years, uh, we are doing pretty well with the US. Uh, in other words, we are having surplus. But uh, at the same time, we are having deficits with the EU, but uh, Korea US FTA, Korea EU, uh, EU FTA is most advanced FTA maybe in the world. Hmm? It's almost similar in terms of quality. But uh, one FTA with EU, we are having deficit. One FTA with the United States, we are having surplus. How do you interpret? Economists saying FTA is just the arrangement, okay? The outcome, in other words, trade deficit or trade surplus, is outcome of how you use this FTA. Okay, so most, you know, uh, critically, economists saying FTA is a system. 
main factor which is influencing uh, uh, surplus or deficit is more like a macroeconomic phenomena. In other words, if the U.S. economy is doing good, doing good means you are consuming more. You are definitely importing more from Korea. Korean economy for the last three or four years, our gross rate is on, almost 1%, 1 not over 2%. We are not doing very well. We are in deep recession. In other words, we are not importing very much from the United States. So that's, that's the result. We are having surplus, not because we are exporting more and we are importing less, but because we are importing less because we are in recession. And U.S. is picking up their own economy. They are import, uh, importing more from, from, from us. And maybe vice versa for Korea, EU, FTA. So we argue more macroeconomic situation of member countries are deciding factor in terms of you know, whether you have surplus or deficit. But that kind of argument is not, uh, is not uh, eligible to uh, President Trump. Uh, he, he's not listening to that kind of stuff. You have a, we have a deficit. We have to get rid of these deficits. Okay? And uh, right now, uh, I told you, uh, China has huge deficits. Think about 2015. I don't know whether you can imagine how big this number is. 2015, United States had the trade deficits of $730 billion. $730, almost $1 trillion of uh, trade uh, deficits. Huge, you know. Our GDP is uh, $1.4 trillion. But U.S. trade deficit is $730 billion. The next year, 2016, it become a $500 billion, a huge deficit. Out of that deficit, uh, China is half of them. In other words, China was having trade surplus against the uh, United States, $370 billion. And next group is $60 billion uh, surplus against the uh, against United States, which is Germany and Japan and Mexico. And then, you know, $220 billion like Korea, Taiwan. But in other words, China and then Germany, Japan, and Mexico are having huge trade uh, surplus uh, against the uh, United States. That's why uh, U.S. is picking up those countries. But um, U.S. is not, U.S. is, you know, asking Germany a little bit too, but uh, not much uh, against Germany. But uh, they are picking up China and then Japan and then Mexico, and Mexico and Korea, they had an FTA. So those two countries are picked up by uh, Trump, and then we want to renegotiate uh, the FTAs because uh, President Trump thinks that uh, this FTA is tilted in favor of Korea. But I, I don't buy this, but uh, still, that's, that's the argument. That's why we are having uh, some negotiation on uh, amendment, but uh, we cannot predict uh, what will happen to this kind of uh, renegotiations. This is difficult, politically sensitive, OK? But in, other way, in other words, uh, in, other, in any case, we are doing that kind of stuff. What about China? Actually, I started uh, launching the FTA negotiation with China, uh, which was 2012, May the 2nd. For several years before 2012, uh, China really asked Korea to start out, uh, the FTA negotiations. I think China was thinking that maybe Korea is having FTA negotiation with China, uh, with the United States, which is really uh, their concern. So he, they, China really want to have FTA with Korea. Uh, I actually followed the summit meeting with our president in uh, January 2012 to Beijing. And I see the, the Premier uh, Hu Jintao and uh, Prime Minister uh, Wen Zabao separately asking our president, we should start our negotiations as soon as possible. But uh, it took many, many years. And then uh, we uh, started our negotiation on 2012. It ended and then started to be implemented 2015. December, soon, I mean, December 20th. Uh, 
when I start, you know, Korea-China FTA negotiations, I told you now we need uh, this FTA because we now, sh you know, sh we should uh, target the Chinese domestic market, not processing trade. We have to sell goods to Chinese consumers. To overcome trade barriers of China, we need a FTA which can dismantle barriers. So that's why we started. Our plan uh, is quite technical, but uh, let me just give you the uh, some kind of uh, criteria. If you can evaluate one FTA, the best FTA is 100 points. If I give 100 points for certain FTA, perfect FTA in terms of liberalization, which means that uh, WTO is recommending within 10 year period, you dismantle every tariff on every good within 10 years. Okay? Some goods you are eliminating tariff uh, right away, some goods over 10 year period. So if you do that, 100%. But Korea, US, Korea, EU, after 10 years, the score is 97.5%. In other words, 2.5% will allow some exceptions because of the, both countries have sensitive items, especially Korea. We have a sensitive items like rice and some agricultural products. That's the kind of high quality FTA. So when we start Korea-China FTA, we saw maybe China is different and also a difficult country to open up. So what do we say our target is 90, 90 percent, 90, you know, 90 uh, points. So that's our plan. And at the minimum, 85 percent. That's our plan. But our team stepped down as, you know, when the new government came in in 2013. So later, two years later, it is concluded. And the outcome was revealed. The score was 66.2 points. It's much lower than we expected. So that's why the you know, international community doesn't consider Korea-China FTA as a threat. Okay. Still, it's good, but uh, it's not high level. But in, a, in any case, we needed Korea-China FTA because we want to penetrate into Chinese domestic market. Very important. Look at the world. You know? Who is growing? Now, uh, United States uh, total GDP is $17 trillion, roughly speaking. China, $10 trillion. So U.S. is number one, and number two is China. $10 trillion economy, Korea is $1.4 trillion. So seven times more than, bigger than Korean uh, economy. It is growing still at the rate of 6.5%, which means domestic markets are growing. And China is very close to Korea. And why not, you know, we are having FTA, we have to concentrate on selling goods not uh, producing goods in, in China, selling goods to China. So that's why we needed to uh, have an FTA with China, but the, the quality is impressive, but still uh, it's good to have a Korea-China FTA. And the third one is, what about the rest of the region in the world, like Latin America, Russia, Africa? I think Korean companies are still very dynamic and active, so maybe companies will expand their trade activities into that kind of uh, areas in the future. So I said this is a great potential for Korean companies later. Hmm? They can export these things to, uh, to uh, other countries. So uh, the first part I want to conclude in a minute and then you can have a uh, 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 rest. Let me tell you one story uh, about uh, uh, some report uh, produced by ASEAN Development Bank, we call ADB, which is located in Manila, uh, Philippines. Several years ago, that organization produced a report. It's a little bit outdated, but still has some good implication, called Asia 2050. Asia 2050. Future, you know, kind of prediction. Many, many, you know, scenarios. But the key uh, aspect of their uh, report is this. By the time of 2050, which is you know, quite a long time uh, uh, later, they are estimating the population of Asia, uh, uh, you know, broad Asia, including every, every countries. 
those groups uh, who are entering into, newly, newly entering into so-called middle income classes. Middle income classes means what? You are, you know, annual GDP is 8,000 to 10,000 and that kind of stuff. So you are a poor country, but you are entering into newly into uh, middle class, uh, uh, middle income classes. That population alone by 2050 in Asia is 3 billion people, 3 billion people in Asia. Of course, you know, uh, Japan, Korea, China already entering into aging population kind of society, but uh, other parts of the, you know, Asia, like uh, ASEAN, you know, Pakistan, you know, uh, India, all other, other countries, they are growing rapidly in terms of their own population, and they are making economic development. So three billion dollars, three billion people are entering into middle income class. If you become a middle income class out of very poor situation, what do you want to do using more money? You want to purchase some good things, right? Typically what? Typically, you know, refrigerator, nice refrigerator, nice smart TV, smartphone, small size, you know, automobile, and washing machines, you know, all kinds of things you, you, you want to uh, buy. And uh, that's the characteristic of middle income class demand, right? And this report says, without much reason, Korea by 2050, Korea will be second largest per capita income country below the United States. So I was surprised. I asked the reporters, there's a scenario, you know, good scenario, middle scenario, poor scenario, but best scenario, he said that Korea will be uh, number two in the world, after, right after the uh, United States, uh, having more than uh, $100,000 of uh, per capita income. So I ask, you know, did you consider unification? Did you consider you know, many, many questions? No, we don't consider that. What do they consider is the size of middle income population. We are entering into the new, new, new middle income class, three billion people. What do they want to buy? Those items you are describing are best produced by Korean companies. Samsung, LG, you know, Hyundai. So simply, those, maybe these companies will be uh, disappeared. I mean, we don't know. But if they succeed, they don't necessarily produce these goods in, in Korea. They can produce in India, you know, other, other, other countries are using cheap labors. But anyway, those names are quite impressive. That's why they give a, a huge credit to the future economy. I don't buy this, but uh, you know, that's the situation. So the remaining area, we can do better in the, in the future. Right now, they are more concentrated on major trading partners, but in the future, they have a good potential to expand their trade activities in the future. Okay, let's take a break and then come back.